Could I please request that all phones are put on silence? Please, 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 it's a request from the depth of my heart. If your phone starts ringing, we will come over to you and ask you to leave. So please put it on silent, please. Okay, the other thing to announce is that of course we do have a 15 minute Q&A at the end, so please save your questions for the end. There will be microphones around, so don't panic, you can have your say. So without further ado, Please, can I welcome you to this session, Dark Night of the Soul, Crime and Literature, and please give a very warm hand to our panelists, Frank Tillier, Vikram Chandra, and Meeta Kapoor. Good evening, everyone. Can I be heard at the back? Okay, great. Uh, we're, we're running five minutes late, so I'll launch straight into the sessions. Uh, I'm sure you all have read the profiles of the speakers who are here. There's Frank from France, and we have Vikram Chandra, who has already done many sessions before, so I, I, I won't do the introductions formally. We've got, what we have here is, we've got two very formidable brains sitting with us. There's Vikram, whose novel, Sacred Games, uh, which deals with espionage, which deals with police processes, gangster wars. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum of the same genre of crime writing is a mind-boggling page turner, um, Syndrome E by, Fra uh, by Frank, which is dealing with hard science concepts. On the face of it, it looks that they're both two very, very different kind of crime, crime writers. But there is a certain thread of commonality that's running. And I'm going to start with asking uh, you, Vikram, because what I find in their work is they're both dealing with failures. They're both dealing with failures of systems, which is what Frank is doing in his writing, in his crime writing, and what Vikram is doing is that he's dealing with the failure of human nature, the darkness of, of what I would say the human mind, what makes it function the way it does when it does something violent. Um, I'm going to ask both of you, um, starting with Vikram, as to why did you turn to crime writing to explore the darkness of human nature? What was it that led you to do Sacred Games? Um, well, with me, it's <clears throat> whenever I start something, it's usually out of curiosity. Um, and what began my curiosity was living in Bombay through the 80s and 90s and the early parts of the 2000s. And if any of you were there, or even if you were in any part of India, You'll recall those days when you would open the newspaper in the morning and you would hear, read something like, two killed in encounter in Bhayandar. And then you would turn the page and it would be um, so and so shot dead by gangsters in Bandra, right? So it was like a daily cricket score. And I grew up, have grown up around the film industry in, um, in Bombay. And my friends, my relatives, my acquaintances, were all the targets of extortion by the organized crime companies in Bombay. So I started to wonder why this was happening, right? I mean, you could see it right on my street. So I started to then um, talk to friends of mine, journalists, policemen, to try and figure out what was actually going on. And I have to say that at the beginning, I did think I was writing a very traditional police procedural in which you have a dead body on the first page, and then 220 pages later, you know who killed it, who killed that person, and why. And I realize now that that was a very naive way of thinking about what I was actually trying to tackle, because you can't write about organized crime, especially in India, without actually realizing that organized crime cannot exist without the collusion of pol politics, right? Politics and organized crime go hand in hand. There's an exchange of value, right, uh, at every stage. So suddenly I'm writing also a political novel, right? And then I realized, well, you can't write about politics in today's India without writing about religion. And if you're writing about religion, then you're writing about the, the, 
the, um, the uses of modern media, especially television. Um, and there was also a moment um, early in my research, I was sitting with a very senior policeman um, in an office in Bombay, and I was asking him about one particular killing that had just taken place the day before. And he said, look, Vikram, I can tell you all about that operation and why we did it and how we did it, but you'll never understand it unless you go to Delhi and talk to people, you know, A, B, and C. And the people A, B, and C that he named were people in the intelligence agencies. And what he was trying to point out to me was that what was happening on my street was in some ways connected through to national affairs, to affairs of state, because all the local intelligence agencies, as everyone in this audience probably knows, uses these organized crime companies as extra constitutional arms of the state. So if you have a very dirty operation to do, who better than to get, so for instance, Shota Rajan to do it for you, right? Because that gives you plausible identity, uh, deniability. So all of a sudden then I'm writing a novel which has spies in it. <laughs> so it finally grew up into this 900 page monster at, and in which the, the, the essential sort of organizing metaphor of the novel is a web, a network, right? So that something that happens on your street can actually be caused by something that is happening on the other side of the country and perhaps on another side of the, uh, on, in another country altogether across the border. So I guess for me, evil then um, resides in these, con these, these concentric networks of power and of greed that interact with each other and then produce effects on our lives which we might not ever understand and never understand why our lives get broken by something that ha is happening very far away. Thank you, Vikram. Um, I think Fr Frank has a very, very uh, different take on this. Uh, he worked as a computer engineer for many years, and he was trying to still writing crime novels at that point, but then, as he told me, that you gave up your job as a computer engineer, but why did you make this transition? What made you choose writing crime novels? One. Two, what made you Pick it up from the hard science background. Okay. Good morning. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, I didn't choose to write a crime novel. I, I wrote a story that I had in mind, and it was a crime novel. Why? Because when I was a young girl, when I was a teenager, I really liked to read crime novels and watching a lot of film, horror films, suspense, crime novel. I, I tried to understand to find the murderer, I had a scientist mind, and I wanted to solve the problem that the writer uh, gave to me. And uh, my friends were going outside, they were going to party, they, they, they were going to, to play sports, and I was staying in my, in my room, and I was reading crime novels, and I was watching films, so I, I had a lot of uh, violent pictures in my head uh, with all those literature and at the moment of my life um, I had to extract this of my mind because that was too heavy for me to to keep that and uh, I began to imagine a story every day the characters were there in my head every night they were they were knocking on the door and um, at the moment I had to extract this and I I had a, a, a paper, I had a pencil, and I began to, to write this story. And of course, it, it was a crime novel because this is what I, I loved. And um, I was also fascinated by science. This is my, my job, this is what I did what, when I was younger. I, I like physics, I like, I like mathematics, I like biology. And uh, my way to to write crime novels, is trying, I try to put science in, the, in my story. And uh, science and literature seems completely different, but in crime novels, it's not so different because, you know, uh, when, you, when you, you, you build a, a watch, you, you, have to be, you have to put pieces together so that at the end, your watch gives a good, the good time. And when you build a crime novel, you have to think at 
every time what will happen in your novel. You have to be very precise because your reader, uh, the readers uh, are very, um, they, they, they read a lot of crime novel. They know all everything. And um, it, it is, uh, when you build your story, you have to think to every pieces of your work. And this is science because you have problem to solve when you write, you, you, you have to, to, to solve those problems so that at the end you have a good story. Right. Um, I'm going to come back to Vikram and ask him. So you spoke about the concentric circles of organized crime and how they become extended arms um, of various kind of actions. You obviously have researched a lot and observed a lot. So you met people who are members of gangs You've obviously worked, I mean, you, part of your research was also to sit with policemen and get all the details out. The nexus that makes for fascinating study between the two uh, absolutely opposite poles of the society. There must be a lot of incidents, a lot of memories that you have, which maybe you didn't put into the book, um, but have stayed and re keep reverberating in your mind. Would you, would you like to reveal some of those? Maybe some interesting conversations, maybe some, some scandalous stuff, some, something that is a little more, <laughs> something that has been concealed, because uh, there, are, there are so many nuances to your writing. There's so much layering happening in sacred games that I, I, it left me, I wanted to know more. Well, the reason that they have been <laughs> concealed is probably because it wouldn't be that safe to actually reveal them. <laughs> yeah, I know, but come on, so, it's been years now. No, but the bad guys and the so-called good guys are pretty sensitive about having their internal information revealed. Um, but I, I mean, I guess sometimes, okay, so, so what is interesting is that, that um, one of the early, the very earliest people that I met through the good offices of my friend, the very famous crime journalist, Hussein Dehdi, whose work I'm sure you've read, um, was a man called Hussein Ustra. <laughs> and Hussein Ustra was, was called that because uh, in his early days of his, of his career, he liked to carry one of those straight razors, right, with the thing. And he was famous in his little area in Bombay, in South Bombay, for slicing up people with his ustra. So the, therefore, he became Hussein Ustra. So the first time that I went to met him, uh, to meet him with Hussein, uh, we were told to wait on a street corner. And then this boy comes and he takes us through many, many lanes and through circuit, uh, a circuit of lanes. And then he takes us up this very narrow staircase. And there is a brown door. And um, uh, I didn't realize until the door opened and then I touched the door that the door was actually not wood as I thought, but it was made out of metal, mm. right? It was hardened metal. And when I went in, the first thing that I saw was a rank of video cameras, and which were showing scenes from all of the lanes that we had just walked down, right? So here is Hussein Ustra, this very dangerous man who lives in a constant state of fear inside this tiny little apartment which he has barricaded himself into. And he looks like a stockbroker, right? He's wearing the sort of South Bombay stockbroker uniform of white shirt, white pant, black shoes, right? And he's very tidily put together. So we talk and, and um, I asked him about his career and I asked him about his life he pulled out his little pistol and he showed it to me and he demonstrated to me how fast he was with his draw. Um, and then so finally I asked him, so Hussein Saab, how do you see the future? Do you see yourself retiring? <laughs> what, what happens finally? So he said, he looked at me very directly and very casually said, nahi nahi, maine bhoaton ke liye um, uh, right. So he, he had in his head this constant news. So anyway, so we say goodbye uh, and, and I called him several times afterwards during the course of my research because he was one of these rare people 
um, if you're a researcher, if you're a writer, you talk to a lot of people, but when you ask people for specific pieces of information or processes, there's some people who just ramble, right? You ask them, how do you do X? And they will go and tell you Y, Z, A, and B, and C, but they will not tell you X. But Hussein was very, very smart, and he could give you an exact, diff completely algorithmic, precise definition. So when I needed to know things like, how do you steal an election, right? How do you do booth capturing? So Hussein Ustra would be my source. I would call him, Hussein Saab, tell me how you steal an election. And he would say, okay, you need these many motorcycles. You need these many guys. <laughs> You need these many boys on the back of the motorcycles with soda bottles that they will shake and throw, <laughs> right? And so he could give you this precise thing. So anyway, so we had this sort of strange phone relationship for a while where I would call him with questions and he would answer me. And then one day, Hussein Zaidi, my friend, called me and he said, well, Ustra ka khadda khod diya kisi ne. And what had happened was that uh, he had done the sort of elemental gangster mistake of falling in love. <laughs> and he fell in love with apparently somebody who was vaguely related to his prime enemy, which was Dawood Ibrahim. And so there was apparently some sort of method by which the Dawood people had put pressure on this woman or somebody close to her and had gotten information when Ustra was going to visit her. And so he went and visited her, he came out to his car, the driver had obviously disappeared, and as soon as he came out, they got him, right? And he died. So that was one of my first sort of encounters with the sort of uh, brutal necessities of the life of violence, of the kind of elemental precautions that people take, and that Despite all that, human nature will then let you make these kinds of mistakes. And after the fact, I was talking to another very senior policeman in Bombay, who's a friend of mine, and I asked him, I said, you know, why did he do that? He knew he was putting himself in danger, especially by visiting her not elsewhere but at his house. And my friend, the policeman, said, I told him that many times. I said, don't go there. But I don't know what it was. It was partly, I guess, Ustra's machismo. I am, after all, Hussein Ustra. I have survived all these years, but it finally got him. He, it killed him. Interesting, and I'm sure, I think if we sit with Vikram outside the session, you'll get a lot more information out. Um, Frank, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you've used science. Um, so the book that I was reading of Frank called The Syndrome E, it starts with very short staccato sentences where this film collector puts on a film, he sees some images and he goes blind. And the next thing you read is somebody dies and the, nobody can make out why it's fine, why, why he's turned blind and then the plot unfolds and then you, then you have this whole subtexting and sub-imaging happening within films, and I don't know how, how did you think of using hard science facts and weave them into your plot and make it such a mind-boggling, very layered plot? Because every time you, the reader feels that, yes, I'm, I'm getting somewhere, you stump me as a reader. And I'm like, I put the book down and I ask, I said, oh my God, now what's he going to do? How, how does his brain function? Yes, this is not, not easy. Um, in fact, I, I think that um, in, in crime novels, as you said before, we, we all start, we all talk about failures in the system. Uh, in fact, Vikram and I, we are writing very different books, but we are writing the same books. They are, they are different because, of course, my, my book happened in France with French police, with a French system, which, which is very different from Indian system. Um, I'm interested in science, so I talk about science things, and Vikram talk about uh, the society, he talk about corruption, he talk about Bombay, so they are very, very uh, different. But they are the same because 
we talk about the failures of our society, and we try to decrypt to see how this failure will modify the way of life of the people impacted by this. Um, why me, you, your neighbor, your friend, at the moment of his of its life, will cross the frontier between light and dark? Why someone at the moment of his life will kill somebody else, which is the the most awful thing in the world? And all I think that all crime writers are doing this with their own voice, of course, but they all try to explain this. They all try to to uh, to expose to the readers their own vision of this of this failure. Um, I I try to put science in my book because this is what I like to, to say. I like making research. I like going to see policemen, going to see doctors, going to, to see scientists, um, and talk with them and trying to understand their job and um, trying to, to uh, decrypt the science. Of course, science is something wonderful because it helps us to live longer and better and it fights against viruses, and it gives us medication, and so on. But science has also bad size, a bad side, and this is this bad side that interests me. And um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the human being, or the human works, his brain, or the brain is working, or, or the memory is working, or the DNA. And so I take a subject, a special subject for Syndrome A, for example, it was the power of pictures. How all the, all the picture, violent picture, can impact the brain of someone and modify his uh, behavior. Uh, you know today, uh, our children uh, have to, uh, they see pictures everywhere, on the internet, in the street, on the information, in video games. Video games are very violent, so the violence is everywhere. And what will happen to these children who are growing now in a, uh, with all those violent pictures around them? And so I, I really make research on, on this subject, and I try to, uh, to, uh, to build a book. So I've made a book about um, organ traffic, trafficking, for example, in in South America uh, during the dictature. So uh, I, I, I've made research uh, about viruses, someone who wants to broadcast viruses. And um, this, is, um, this is a way for me to talk about science, of course. I talk about history because I try to find this subject in the past year. And in fact, this is a crime novel because um, we are, of course, we are telling a story. The, the main goal of a book is, is to give a good moment to the readers. When someone reads a book because he wants to, first of all, he wants to spend a good time reading a book, a good story and with a suspense and page turner. But uh, if we can, as a writer, add a message in the story, if we can uh, give information to the readers about how our world is working today. Uh, it's better because at the end of the, of the book, the, the, the readers has learned things and he has questions and he will make research and he, he will discover things that you, you talk about in the book. I've, um, I've read the, the book of Vikram, Sacred Games, and for me, it's better than all the books of India that, that to discover India. Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's for me the, f the first time that I come in, in India, and I could have read a, a tourist book, and a history book, and a region book, and so on. And I took the book of Vikram, and everything is in this book about India. Everything. You have, you have all the people are living, really, the, the, the bad guys, but the good guys, the family, you, you talk about religion, you talk about um, uh, uh, the real life of people. And this is, um, when I've read your book and I came here and I, 
I, I saw things in the street, and I say, yes, that was in the book, and I, I had the feeling to, to know li a little about, about this wonderful country, you, you know? And this is a crime novel, this is. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, I mean, and I've read your book and I admired it a lot too because of the questions that it brought up in my mind about what the kind of media um, saturated world we live in and what it actually does to us. And I think you're very right in saying that even though one might write in very different modes, what the detective novel allows us to do is to explore a culture, a society, from the top to the bottom and from side to side, right? So if you think about the classical structure of the detective novel, you usually start with a dead body, right? And the dead body is not the reason for why this dead body exists is not known, right? So to get a little literary theor theoretical, it's like a signifier, but we don't know what it actually signifies, right? And then the outside expert, the detective, comes in, and by constructing, by looking at the clues and constructing a kind of scientific theory on the basis of this clue, the detective then starts to trace a series of connections through the culture. Right? And often the, trace, the, the connections will lead upwards. Right? So you'll find that this dead body might be of somebody who's really peripheral, who's really outsider, right? like a prostitute maybe. But the connections that then get traced will lead to the mayor of the town. Right? So it, the, the layers of the culture from top to bottom and how they operate on each other, how power operates within these layers, gets illuminated by our journey with the detective. And what I mean by from side to side is that along the way you might learn everything about the hotel industry because the prostitute worked in hotels, right? You might get a side sort of um, journey through the pharmaceutical industry because the mayor is, is smuggling pharmaceuticals, right? So what you end up finally doing is getting a very finely tuned three-dimensional version of a culture, and you come as a reader to some sort of understanding of how power, greed, and love, and friendship works within this entire structure. Which gets me to the ancillary question which I had in mind. You have Sartad Singh, who was featured earlier in your earlier book also, and he's from the police force, and then you have Ganesh, who's the Don. Somewhere while reading the book again, uh, what struck me very curiously was that I was, I found myself rooting for Ganesh. Mm -hmm. And have you had these kind of reactions from other readers? Yeah. And what is it, did you do it consciously or did it just kind of happen in the writing process? No, very, very consciously. I made huge efforts. See, I mean, for me, the thing as a writer is that what I realized after meeting like Hussein Ustra is that nobody thinks they're a villain, right? I walked up, I, I mean, I, I, one of the first other people that I met, actually, and with my sister, Anupma, who came along with me on that track, was a man uh, named Arun Gauli, who I'm sure most of you have heard of. Ar Arjun Rampal is right now making a movie called Daddy about him, right? So I went and met Daddy way back in the 90s, and uh, in, his, in his house in, in Bombay. And so we talked and, you know, I told him about myself. I asked him all kinds of questions. And then I said, uh, uh, Arun Bhai, how do you explain all these murder cases against you? Uh, you have been accused of all of these acts of violence. And he said, look, I am fighting against an unjust system. I am a revolutionary, <laughs> right? And so, and I'm, you know, you can say that he's spinning what he's doing, that he's completely aware of who he is, but in some sense he believes that, right? He's not a villain in his own mind. So if I'm going to write a book from the, half a book from the point of view of somebody who becomes a mafia don, I have to get inside his skin. I have to understand the world from the way that he looks at it, from the way that he mythologizes himself, the way that he sees himself as an actor in the world. Right? And so that's what I tried to do. And, and my job then as a writer is to try and walk in his shoes. And there was this one very pleasing moment when my wife, then girlfriend Melanie, was reading the first draft of the book. 
and she had been reading it for about a week. She got halfway through it, and one day she walked out of the study and said to me, I hate you for making me like this guy. <laughs> because, you know, Ganesh Gaitonde is a really bad man, right? And at that moment, I felt this enormous feeling of writerly satisfaction. I said, okay, now I've done my job. Yeah, that, that's a good feeling, I'm sure. Uh, even in Frank's book, we have a very, very textured character. And it, it's, it's, it's a very complex character that you've created from your main detective, Frank Sharko. So what, what made you put him together the way you have? Because here I liked the Don, but here I like the detective. Mm, thank you. So. <laughs> and this is very, characters are very important in crime novel. Uh, they are very, as more important as the story that you will tell because uh, people need to love your character, to, to love the book. And uh, I've created Frank Charcot uh, at the beginning, at my first book, and um, it, is, uh, it is very, very complicated to create a, 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 police, a police character because there are so many good characters that already exist in the crime novels. Uh, for, for Hercule Poirot, uh, very great um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, and so on. And so you, you have to create a character, and you have to, to create a character different of those characters that are already existing. And you have to create a police man, so he has to be as real as a real policeman. And you have to, to avoid what we call a cliché, that means, uh, you know, uh, the, bad, the, bad, the bad guy that uh, drinks a lot and uh, that, that is depressive. And so you, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, and you have to create your own character that, that has his own identity. And that Frank Charcot today is Frank Charcot. People know knows him as Frank Charcot. And I'm very happy because um, the readers love this, this character. He, he, he was very human. He has problem like everybody. He's not a, 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 a hero. Uh, he's just a man with, with his problem. And, um, and so I keep this, this guy and I, I, in my other books. So it, this is, is a fifth, uh, five or six story with Frank Charcot. Um, but you know, it's also complicated to have uh, a, per a character that comes to um, a recurrent, recurrent, it's a, a recurrent character because, um, of course, when you create a new character, you have to imagine everything about the character. You have to imagine how he, how he is, you have to imagine his past, you have to imagine his, his psychology. So it's, it's complicated. But when the character is existing, you don't need to do that. But you need to create new things in the new book because people want to, lear to, to learn new things about your character. They want that you have new problems. Yeah, you should have. A, uh, so it's also complicated. And, um, but in fact, it's not me who decide to, to, to keep the, the character. It's the, my readers. Uh, when I created this character, they, they read my first book and they come to see me and they said, oh, uh, this was a, a good character, uh, what will be his next story? So um, I, I say, okay, okay, I will take this character again, I make a new story, a second one, and then and a, a third one, and then the character now is, uh, is always here with me in my, uh, in my books and uh, is a part of my life because I, I'm always seeking to this, uh, this character. He's it's, it's, it's like a, a friend, a friend. He's become a friend of yours yes. eh, in your mind. Uh, I'm going to take off from what Frank said about Vikram's book and he's talking about the real India because when he's, he's identifying with what he's seeing on the streets and it's his first visit, his visit to India. Vikram, Bombay is as palpable as a character in your it's as palpable as a character. It lives. It's just not a city. It's actually playing a role in the book. So how did you, one, it's a locally intense Indian city portrayed in such vivid detail, and yet the book managed to become an international bestseller. Hmm. Well, I, 
I think I didn't start off having this grand plan of making Bombay, uh, as some people called it, a character in the city. Because I think, for me at least as a writer, if you make these grand thematic decisions before you write the book, you always end up failing, right? Because you burden yourself then with all these missions that you've set up in your head. So my job as a writer every day was to sort of, you know, just write today's scene and then try and make it as physically and alive in the mind of the reader as I possibly can. And by physically alive, I mean in terms of smell, in terms of the way a thing, something looks, um, the way that dirt is on the street, the sound of the street. And this is also why, um, I mean, I often call it research when I go out and meet people in their environments, like a policeman in his cabin. But it's not actually focused research in the sense that a journalist might do it, right? I sometimes just make up questions to ask people, even though, I mean, I'm not that interested in the answer. What interests me more is getting into that environment. And then I, what I find is that even subconsciously, I start picking up things about that environment that I end up finding very useful many years later on, right? So I remember one of the, the examples that I can give you of this is that I was talking to a very young cop in Santa Cruz in his office, and we had a long conversation about this and that and the other, and then three years later I'm writing a scene, and what I suddenly remembered was that he was very flashy, right? He was very stylish, he was in his civvies, and he had these very fancy Ray-Ban uh, dark glasses on his desk. He had the latest cell phone. And the thing that struck me most later was that he had the most complicated pair of athletic shoes I had ever seen. Like, <laughs> you wouldn't even, like, it's Michael Jordan plus 10 times, right? <laughs> and for some reason, that detail then stayed with me, and I could very usefully deploy that in a scene that I was writing about. So I think it's those that texture that you can get from life that comes to you when you put yourself in the right situation, when you're ready to absorb information, that then filters gradually into your book or your movie or whatever it is that you're writing, and then gives people that feeling that they're actually living in an, or imagined, they can imagine themselves and transport themselves into the landscape that you're trying to make, if that makes any sense. Uh, one thing that is common to both Frank and Vikram is that they both are working with television scripts. You've just started the scripting for Sacred Dreams for Netflix, and Frank also, Frank, you also write for TV, right? So is one of your books being put into a TV script or a uh, series or? Yes, um, um, one of my book in a uh, few years ago, uh, there was a, a cinema film of, of a, there was an adaptation. Uh, I also uh, like Vikram um, writing scripts uh, for French TV. It's also crime novels, uh, crime uh, stories. Um, I do the both. I do the writing of books and I do the writing of uh, scripts. So how different it is when you're writing yes, it's for a, especially a crime show for television? It's very, it's two things different and because, uh, you know, uh, writing books is something very uh, personal, very personal. You are alone in your, in your desk, in your office, and uh, you, are, you have your, your paper and you have to imagine your story and you have nothing to ask what to do. You have to imagine your story by, by yourself. You are really alone. It's, it's really a, a writer is a lonely work. And, but when you write for, for TV, a script for TV or for the cinema or for Netflix, uh, there are many, many people that are around you and you are just a, a part of the story. Uh, as a writer, you, you write the whole story, but as a script writer, you're just a part. Of course, you you're write, you imagine the story, and you write it, but sometimes you are two or three script writers, and then the director of the film wants to modify the script, and the producer wants to modify, and the, 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 the TV wants to modify, and so you have meetings, and everything wants to, 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 to uh, make its own modification. 
But I think it's a good thing because it's social life. We are together, and when you are a writer and when you are alone for months in your desk, in your office, uh, it's good to see uh, other people. Um, when you are writing uh, a book, there is no question of money. You can, you can uh, uh, do everything you, you want in the book. You can describe the scenes you want. There, there is no question of money. Uh, for TV, uh, the main question, uh, when you, you, before you imagine the story, they said to you, oh, uh, your story don't, must cost too much money. So uh, it, you have to write, uh, in a, you have to, to think each scene you will write, if it costs lot, a lot of or not money. So uh, this is what we call, a, I think, uh, writing under restraint. That means that you have restraint. You know them before writing the story, but uh, it, it, it's, the, it's the game, it's, it's a part of the, of the game. And um, I've, I really have a pleasure uh, writing uh, scripts because uh, everything you are imagining, imaginating, every write you write on, every word you write on, the, on your paper will become a picture and will become a dialogue, and you will see it on TV, so it's, it's very, it's very uh, uh, a good thing. Challenging. So when you're describing a murder in words, but you're now going to put it into a script, you can make it as bloody and gory, and so what are you doing about that? So, so actually, all of the reasons that he just said that he enjoys it is why I'm not writing the script. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm a really solitary creature. I like the complete control over my material when I'm sitting at, the, at the, my computer. Um, so the way that Netflix is working is that they have contracted with uh, Phantom Films, which I'm sure that all of you guys know. It's Vikramaditya Motwani and Arunarag Kashyap and so forth. Um, and Phantom has assembled a team of brilliantly talented young writers in a writer's room in Bombay, and they are working away on the script. And I have an official title of executive producer or something like that, and I am acting as a consultant. And the way that I am acting as a consultant is that when they need advice, when they need help, I try and help them. And then for the most part, I see my job when they don't need my help is to shut up and get out of the way. Right? <laughs> And the reason being that I think that to go from a novel to a visual medium, you need to make radical transformations, right? It's like to trying to translate from one poetry from one language to another. If you do a literal translation, you lose all the poetry, right? And so the problem with me is that I've already, already imagined the story in my head for print in one way. And I am unable then to make those radical leaps and those changes where, where they are necessary. And I don't want to hold them back, right? And, and they're doing amazing work. And sometimes when I read what they've written, it's so, so brilliant that I go, shit, I should have done it this way in the damn book, right? Why didn't I see this, right? So, um, so, so I think there are certain writers who are able to make this switch between the solitary and the collaborative to go from one medium into the other. In my experience, I find, found myself mm, that I'm more useful on, on, the, on the printed page as opposed to making a script that will then become somebody else's art finally on the screen. Thank you, both of you. I'm going to open the house to questions now. So I'm sure there's somebody ready with the mics. Um, here's the gentleman right in the aisle. Him. Hello. Uh, hi, Vikram. Uh, thanks for sharing your vision. My name is Ankit, and uh, I would like to ask that uh, all the crime fiction in India, don't you think, has been bound to Mumbai or Bombay? Uh, don't you think the um, topics like land mafia or the coal mafia across India are a debatable topic or are... I, I think I got the question, uh, why is there not more crime fiction outside, set outside of Bombay? 
I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that, that um, there needs to be much more and there is starting to be much more, right? I've seen recently crime fiction set in Bangalore, right? Zach Oya is writing it. Uh, I've seen crime fiction set in Delhi. I think Delhi crime fiction is a huge field waiting to be explored, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where is it? Somebody do it, please, right? And then partly also, I should say that when we say this, we are talking about the English language, right? We always seem to forget that in the regional languages, in the vernaculars, there is an enormous, long, 200-year-old tradition of crime fiction that has been dealing with all of this stuff, right? If you read Surendra Mohan Pathak, that is such hard-edged, such excellent crime fiction that I'm surprised that nobody has ever taken advantage of that and made those into, like, 500 movies, right? Um, Tamil has an extensive tradition of crime and detective fiction. In Bengal, we've got Faluda and Vyomkesh Bakshi, which you are finally now no. starting to see um, exposed to a nationwide audience, right? So I think partly this concentration on Bombay is an English language problem. I think in other languages, it's much more widespread. Um, how has the crime landscape changed in Mumbai? I mean, from the times, say, of the 90s, where that, those were the headlines, right? Shootouts in Badala and whatnot. And now, and does that influence your fiction or has it influenced crime fiction in general in any way? I'm having a little trouble hearing. I think the mic's Sound a little... Is not too clear. Too, but I Can think... you just stand up and speak your uh, question? Sure. The, um, the question is, how has the crime landscape changed in Mumbai from the times of the gangs and things like that to perhaps today? And how is that influenced or will influence crime fiction? So the, the organized crime wave of violence has obviously receded. And that happened for a couple of reasons. One is that the Bombay police mounted, starting in about 2004, 2005, a kind of all-out attack on the lower soldiers of the, of the armed hierarchies, right? And they made it too expensive. But the other more compelling reason was that the gangs themselves realized that it was pointless to be killing each other in the streets, right? So that old idea that you can steal more with a briefcase than you can with a machine gun, right? And again, I'm going to steal one of Hussein Zaidi's line. He was talking to a very senior statesman kind of crime figure in Delhi a couple of years back. And Hussein was complaining to him, I don't have anything to write about. There's no more hot stories. So he said, yeah, look, listen, at that time we were in high school. Now we have got postgraduate. We have gone postgraduate. So we understand that in order to make money, you don't need to be actually shooting people in the streets. Right? So the organized crime still exists, it's still intensely powerful, the connections and collusions with the political structures are still there, but they're much smarter, right? It doesn't come out into the open as much, except now and then, maybe once or twice a year, there will be a very precisely targeted hit on one person or two people, right? The rest of the time, it just operates, and it's invisible. And a lot of it has been converted into quote unquote white, right? So you take your ill gotten money and then you put it in real estate, you put it in factories, right? So it's still, don't worry, it's still all <laughs> going on. <laughs> but, but they're smarter about it, right? The, the, the sort of shootout Wild West thing is now, I think, more from what I understand from far away happening in Eastern Europe, UP, right? The kidnappings and so forth. Yeah. There's a question here in the front. I will move to the back. Awesome session. Thank you so much. My question is, uh, most people stick with the genre. You seem to have successfully been able to you know, move from one to the next to the next, from your first book to this, to the geek book, and so on and so forth. How, I mean, uh, A, how is it different to go from one to the next? And uh, how do you successfully do that? I mean, that's really hard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's partly just, like I said, I'm so driven by curiosity, right? So that I got curious about organized crime, I got curious about um, policing, and by the time that I finish a project like that, 
I've sort of, at least for a little while, satiated my curiosity about that thing, right? So then I start to get curious about something else and I move on to the next thing. Um, so it's a kind of dilettante-ish way to live a life, right? And I have a couple of friends who actually complain about this. They said, you know, you have Sartaj Singh, people like Sartaj Singh, why don't you write a damn sequel? You'll make a lot of money. But I like Sartaj, he's a good friend of mine, but I don't think I'm ready to come back to him yet. Uh, but you'll see him shortly on the small screen. We have time for just two more questions. And um, OK, so yeah, please go ahead. So what I want to ask from you is this, that we speak a lot about crime, but how to stop it? Any measures? To, because crime fiction relates to so many things. But as a student of English literature, I teach English literature. My name is Umesh Prasad Singh. I am from the University of Calcutta. We must now have certain measures. Those things. I think you must know how Just to solve say some crime. How do, you, how do you solve crime? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take that question? Do you want to take this question? He's, how he's do asking you how do you stop and how do you solve crime? How do you make things better? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 It's, it's, it's complicated. Um, how do I make things better? Uh, I think that um, in our books we try to. Uh, we, we never have the, 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 the response to the subject that we try to uh, uh, to describe. We we have our own uh, uh, um, We have our own interpretation of of, of the society and. Uh, Interpretation of the crime and me and another writer will be different. We have a voice, our own voice, and we try to uh, to understand by ourselves how the, the world is working, and we put it in our story. But we don't have the, of course, we don't have the the, the response to this because it's too complex. But we try to uh, to show to people how the things are working, and we, it's the people who have to to think about this. It's not us who have to give the, the, the response. Every read, reader has to make his own uh, interpretation of a book and he has to, to have his own question of the society. And each reader has to uh, try to solve, to, to, uh, to, uh, to think about how to make things better. Uh, we are just here to, uh, to uh, point things, to, to say to people, you know this has existed in the past, and this is what happened, and I put this in my book, and I saw this, saw, show this to you, and now you, you have the real things that happen, and you have to, to try to uh, think by, uh, by yourself, in fact. But there, there is no uh, uh, response. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've made book about violence. Uh, I've, I've written uh, one... Uh, 1,200 pages with the main subject about violence. Why violence exists? Is it genetics? Is it because of society? Is it because of culture? Is it because of everything? And I don't have the, the response of this because it's, it's too complicated, but I try to, to spot, to, to, to give this to my readers and know that it's the readers who, who need to, to, uh, to solve this. Do we have time for one more question? Just one last question, please. There's this lady in the row here. Um, yeah. Um, this question is for Frank. One of the things that uh, we've all heard is that when you write in two, uh, you know, Vikram writes in English, you write in French, and this book is actually translated into English. So the first part of the question is, have you read the English translation? Yes, I have. Uh, I have not the whole book, but I wanted to to, uh, to see. Uh, it, it was a, a good translation, and uh, yes, I, I, uh, it was a very good translation. The main difficulty with my uh, my books is that there are a lot of science in it, complicated things, and um, it was difficult for me to uh, to read it because, uh, as you can guess, I'm not so fluent. <laughs> in English, and um, I need, uh, for reading my own book uh, in English, I needed to have uh, 
dictionary. So it's not the better way to, uh, uh, to, to, to do that, but um, the, the, it's the problem when, when we are translating another languages, uh, because, for example, I'm translated in uh, Korean, in Chinese, uh, in, in uh, Germany, and I can't see if it's good or not because I, I don't understand the, the language. So, uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question because I have the same difficulty here today. Um, bec uh, this, this conversation in French, no problem for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, the question, if I, if, if I were in France, all this question I could reply and I could reply in a com complex way because this is, uh, I know what to re reply. But here, uh, I wanted to to say things, and in my head I said, no, I won't be able to do this. And so, you hear me, I go, I, I say things, but this is not what I wanted to say in France, but I go in this way because I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to be so, so uh, comprehensive, uh, but you, you're right, I, for, for, for me to talk to you, I have to sing French, and I have to translate this in my head, and I have to say it to you. So you see it's very uh, complicated for me. Sorry. <laughs> but I, I, I'm sorry, uh, much as we would like to, I'm, I'm sure there are both the authors available for book signings outside, so you can post your questions while you're, you're getting your book signed. But thank you, Vikram, and thank you, Frank. And 